This is a help session for the optimization course. You can access the files here at uh, the apmonitor.com website. Go to the optimization course and then visit, uh, visit the spring design problem. This is the one that we'll be covering today. Um, so I, I just wanted to run through um, you know, some, of the, some of the equations more just kind of on a step-by-step -step basis, um, you know, visiting each one individually. Uh, and, and starting, first of all, with just a feasible design point, and then uh, working on through to uh, how to set up the optimization um, problem. So, so first of all, what I've done is I've just taken the uh, diameter of the wire, the diameter of the coil, uh, the number of coils, the, the free height, and then uh, a force, um, and and then just set up all the constants. So here's my deflection. Okay, so so just going down through here, the uh, the deflection amount. This is our preload height. We're trying to maximize this force uh, right here on on the spring. The optimization problem is to maximize this. So we're going to change. Uh, these four variables, wire diameter, coil diameter, number of coils in the spring, and then also the free height. Uh, the preload height is given to us, so we're just going to assume that that is constant. So H naught is just going to be equal to 1. Okay, so that, that's the first one that we're going to put in here. The uh, preload height is 1 inch. Okay, and then the deflection is 0.4. We have some constants that are defined here. Q is... Um, you know, there's, there's just a bunch of constants. I won't go over these uh, specifically, but um, you know, for this problem, you have these constants here. So I've just I've entered them in um, here, and those will go into some of the equations. So, so let's just go through uh, the equations first. So Sy, Sy is uh, the yield strength. Okay, so that is um, 0.44 times Q divided by dy or times uh, w, that nominally is, is this value. So what, what we're going to do is go through these equations and just see if we can replicate um, what we had here in the, you know, just a feasible design. So this is this one right here, the yield strength, and we verified that, yes, we have the right equations, we have the right constants, um, so we can check this one off the list of of uh, equations that we have correct. Okay, and then and then solid height. Uh, that's just going to be the number, um, you know, the number of coils times the times the diameter of the wire. Okay, that's just uh, you know straightforward here. When you this solid height here, when you compress it. You know, when you compress this spring all the way uh, to the point where the wires are touching each other, it's just the number of coils times the diameter of that wire. Uh, of that wire. Okay, so that's um, Right now, I just have that equal to 0.5 because my diameter of my wire, I set to um, 0.5. I guess the well, number of coils is 10. So that should be 10 times that. Okay, there, there's my diameter of the wire. Sorry about that. That was the diameter of the coil. Um, I'm going to delete these just because get rid of the, the fact that it's giving me an error on those. Okay, so um, can, can you guys see this text or is it too small? I can read it. It's okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, and then we also have the uh, the spring uh, stiffness. Okay, in that case, uh, you know, this equation, 7.5, let's just go down and check our, uh, you know, 7.5 is our spring constant. Okay, um, and that's equal there. I'm going to just keep going down through, uh, you know, through these equations. The wall factor, okay, that's the K wall, and it's right here. You know, it's a little bit confusing because you know, you're using capital K and lowercase K. Lowercase K is the spring constant. This is the, the wall factor. Okay, 1.145. Uh, that's just dependent on the coil diameter and the wire diameter. Okay, so let's go down and check that one as well. Um, wall factor. Okay, so check that one off the list as well. Okay, so M. Let's see, where is M? Um, okay, 
Okay, what it, I'm, I'm trying to remember why I why to find M there. Okay, so the coil. Okay, so I just I had used this elsewhere down here, so I just defined kind of an intermediate value M because I'm going to be using it in some of these other uh, equations down here in my tau uh, my tau values. Okay, so um, so so now let's just, uh, go on to the tau max and tau min. So those those are used in um, the tau is defined. Uh, let's see where is tau defined. Tau, tau is defined right up here um, in this equation. And tau is going to be different based on the force. Uh, the force that I have is this is the only thing that is dependent on the height of the spring. Um, the wall factor is just dependent on the diameter of the wire and also the coil. Okay, and then the diameter of the coil and the diameter of the wire cube. This is going to change uh, based on the height, you know, the position that I'm, that I'm at. And so this is uh, this is probably going to be the maximum. This is going to be the maximum tau, and this is going to be the minimum tau right here. Okay, uh, these two because it, you're cycling between this height and this height, you know, kind of an infinite number of times, and uh, yeah. And we want to get the tau max and tau min, the tau min and then the tau max. Okay, so stop me, guys, if I if you have any questions about this because I don't want to just um, rush through this uh, too fast. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how about the uh, force of H F? Okay. Uh, as we talked earlier, so let the uh, maximum force is uh, at F sub H sub F. But now you say that the uh, maximum force is uh, at H deflection, which is which the deflection is point four. Okay, yeah. Um, there's another constraint in here which um, which also talks about the. Uh, Let's see, where is that? There, there was another constraint that, that talked about the maximum. Um, come on in. Hey, come on in. Oh yeah. Um, does anybody remember where that was? It, there's a. There's also a maximum constraint. For what? Um, for the stress. There's a constraint right on the first paragraph, the last line. Yeah. Oh, that's where it was. Okay, the stress at the solid height HS must be less than SY um, to protect the spring from inadvertent damage. Okay, so that that's where that one is going to come in. <clears throat> okay, so that's going to be a constraint that's um, that's going to be further on down. Okay. Okay. So let me go. Let me go back up then. Um, so tau max here. We're just going to do that at the deflection, deflected height. So here's the, um, you know, the height change just from pre height to the nominal preload, and then that's an initial 0.4 inches. Um, and so this is the change in spring height from the no load to the deflected load. And then we have our k value from our spring constant. And then this um, m value, this intermediate value that I defined. Okay, so that gives us our tau max. So here's here's kind of a nominal value that uh, you can use for uh, tau max. That's also consistent um, with the rest of this uh, design problem. I don't think I gave you tau max here, but uh, you know, you, th there it is, right there, the tau max. And then tau min is just going to be without the the delta, um, the deflected height, and uh, you know tau min then is going to be, you know, it, it's going to be about half. Um, well, uh, yeah, right right around half. So that's about eight times ten to the fourth, and that's about four times ten to the fourth on the uh, on the uh, maximum um, 
And now these these towels are the uh, the stress in the spring. Okay, the stress in the spring. So we have a couple constraints here when you uh, fatigue criteria for the uh, compression spring. You have um, T A or tau A, and that's going to be the um, as the average. Okay. And then this right here is the uh, average plus the, the mean shear stress, okay? And that has to be less than SY over SF. Um, now, SF is a, the safety factor. That's where that one uh, comes in is the SF. Okay, so we have a couple other people in the office now. We have uh, Paul, Herman, and Basim as well. So they're just going to participate from here inside the office, okay? So safety factor applies here. I had one question, an interesting question I hadn't thought about from one of the uh, students at the end of class today about whether this safety factor also needs to be applied to um, this constraint up here. Okay, so I, that's a good question. I hadn't applied that in my model, but it'd be interesting to see if that changes the solution um, to see the you know, the solid, the stress at the solid height, you know, in, in this configuration has to be less than SY, but if you're dividing it by a safety factor, that becomes even more restrictive, okay? So more restrictive for that uh, constraint. I, I hadn't intended that, that that would be a constraint, you know, divided by the safety factor, but I'd be, be interested to see if anybody plugs that in and, and comes up with a different solution because it's a binding constraint. Okay, so um, so those are my tau values. Um, I have an upper constraint on this, SE over SF. Okay, that's three times ten to the uh, uh, ten to the fourth. Okay, so that is tau A. So this this value right here has to be less than um, three times ten to the fourth. Okay, so SE. And SF, SF was just a safety factor, um, and SE, you know, these are both constants right here. The safety factor is 1.5, so you're giving it a 50% uh, safety factor um, because you're dividing by 1.5. Okay, so it has to be less than 3 times 10 to the 4th at all times, um, but tau max and tau min are going to be a function of the, the coil diameter and then the wire diameter as well. Okay, so those are going to be those are going to be the design variables. Uh, this constraint doesn't change. It. You can put this into your model um, as SE you know, has to be greater less than SE divided by SF. Okay, and then you have the alternating or sorry the uh, the alternating shear stress and then also the mean shear stress. So adding those two, that has to be less than SY. Now um, SY is the uh, yield strength in shear, and then divided by the, the Factor. Okay, so you have the alternating one and the mean one less than the uh, the shear stress divided by the, the safety factor. I figure if I say everything about twice or three times, you know, it helps. But I'm just I'm just going to keep saying things two or three times, and if you don't get that, I'll say it two or three times again. So in Spanish, okay, we need it in uh, Herman requested it in Spanish. Dos o tres uh, meses. Okay, so I'll say it in Spanish too. Um, sometimes it's hard to hear on the WebEx, so I, uh, I'll just say it a couple times. Um, okay, so so that's TA plus TM, or tau M, tau A plus tau M. And at the nominal conditions, it was equal to uh, about eight times ten to the fourth, and and we have to be less. Um, less than this value right here. So with our nominal conditions, we're violating, uh, you know, we're violating that constraint right there. Okay, so let's see. I had some, you know, diameter of coil divided by diameter of wire. Nominally, that starts out of, off at 10, uh, but you have a lowest constraint of 4 and upper constraint of, of 16, and then a, a coil diameter plus wire. Um, has to be uh, it's currently equal to 0.55, but it has to be um, let's see less than 0.75. I'm trying to think why that why that upper constraint is there. What was that? Can be bigger than 
Like the width oh, yeah, okay, so that was a constraint in the problem. Uh, here it is right here. The, the sum of the two has to be less than 0.75. Okay, so here's some lower constraints, upper constraints for for these values. You see kind of the nominal values that are calculated here. And, and just an approach to solving these, I always like to go into a, an environment where I can just kind of have a some scratch calculations just to write things out. Um, kind of document where my constraints are, what my variables are, and then I can use that as, as you know, it's a little bit more flexible environment than some, some of the optimization environments um, to, to just explore, uh, you know, explore the equations a little bit. Okay, so that's, that's all I have to do. Why What's did that? you leave the 8 out of M? I guess I could have included that. Um, let me see up here. Yeah, I, I probably should have just included the A there with the M and then just multiply by M instead. That's a good point, Frank. Okay. Okay, so um so now we wanna we wanna set this up as an as an optimization problem. So um you, know, you have a lot of equations here, a lot of uh things that you're carrying around trying to so, so the, the first step I'd recommend is instead of just trying to solve the optimization problem, um, the first step would maybe be to make all of these parameters, you know, fixed values, uh, and then just calculate um, this sample design just to make sure that you have have something that agrees with these, uh, you know, design conditions. So if you just if you just plug these in, you should get these answers. Uh, for all of your variables and values. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and just open up uh, your know, model that I have. Uh, okay, and actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing for just a second because I don't want to uh, give you guys essentially the homework problem, uh, and the people in the room here can see. So that's okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do is is um, I'm trying to think about how to how to best do this. Uh, we'll probably end up looking through this anyway. Um, Or do we need the safety factor? Yeah, let's, let's try that safety factor. Um, try the safety factor thing. So what I'm doing is I'm just uh, copying the variables and parameters declarations, and then what we'll do is we'll we'll go ahead and just convert these into a model and talk about not not only the variables and equations, but also good modeling practice for setting up optimization problems. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and share my my desktop again. Um, and okay, so I've shared it. I, I've just set up, you know, just these as, as variables. I'm trying to maximize uh, F, and, and then what I'm going to do is is put as many of these into intermediate equations as I can, and then also I'm going to have some some equations. So uh, as I'm as I'm writing these. I'll, I'll write it kind of the original way, and then what we want to do is rearrange them in a way to avoid things like divide by zeros or, or other things, okay, to avoid uh, the solver getting stuck. Sometimes the solver will report that it's at an infeasible, there's you know, no feasible solution um, because it gets stuck in, a, in, in an area where, you know, it can't converge the model, and it sometimes gets confused. So, so don't be tricked by. You know, sometimes it has no feasible solution. If you get a, a message from the solver that says unbounded solution, then that might be an indication that um, you know that that you don't have the, enough constraints on your problem. Okay, there's a it's allowing the you know the solver found a combination of variables that are going you know, to take it to infinity. On one of the variables. Okay, so um, those are kind of the two things to watch out for uh, when you're setting this up. Let, let me just go through the 
the intermediates. Um, you know, APM is not case specific. So um, I'm just going to go Q. Do I have Q set up? Okay, I do have Q set up. So let me do is I'm gonna I'm gonna share this with everybody on the WebEx. So as as I'm going through it, then if you want to type out your own model, um, you know, you're welcome to. I'm gonna go ahead and um, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to see if I can share a file. Okay. Okay, not supported. Let me let me see if I can rename this as uh, a dot txt. Share file. Okay, this one. I'm just going to send it over to you as. Um, Ah, this doesn't even allow me to send a TXT file. <laughs> Never mind, guys. I was going to send it to you so you could work on it concurrently with me, but um, ah, let's see. Okay, I'll I'll just walk through it. Uh, you guys can uh, you'll have the I'll, I'll, maybe I'll convert the video uh, for later as well, so you guys can have this if you want to work through it, or you can just try to type and keep up if you uh, if you want. Okay, so I'm just gonna do the uh, the D wire, okay, and then that's going to be to the W power. W is point eight one or point one eight. Um, Okay, so that's going to be my first one. I, I can also put it capital. You know, it's not not case sensitive. Um, so my solid height. Uh, you know, I also need that. Uh, that's just going to be the number. Okay, that's just going to be the number of coils um, times the diameter of the wire. You know, stop me if I'm doing anything in a way that um, might be bad practice for modeling. Okay, did you guys notice anything on this one? Okay, can this ever go to zero right here? The diameter of the wire. What do you guys think? Oh, lower bound. Okay, yeah. So we put a we put a lower bound on here to help protect that. Um, one of the things that it wasn't given in the model, but we also know that the diameter of the coil that also has to be greater than zero as well. So I mean, there's just certain bounds that you can put in there to help the solver and you know, to help the optimizer. They're not, um, you know, they're not required, but it can it can certainly help them if you if you include them in your in your problem formulation. Okay, so I'm just going to include greater than zero there. Number of coils. I also know that has to be greater than or equal to zero, um, and and that can also help uh, you know help the solver find a, a solution. This one I'm going to have to say it's going to be greater than 1.0. Um, you know, because my free height is going to be uh, greater than the preload height. And I said that the preload height was 1.0. Okay, so I know that that's always going to be greater than 1. Sometimes when the solver can't find a solution, it's because it's looking in areas where it didn't look and, um, you know, it could cause some problems for the, the convergence. Amos, stop. I think your microphone is providing a little bit of uh, feedback chatter. I'm just going to go ahead and, and mute you. If you want to, if you want to talk in the future, just um, just go ahead and unmute your microphone. Okay. 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 Great. Um, okay. So, all right. So I have. Uh, okay. So so let me keep going then. So I have my. My halt, my solid height, and then I also need my k value. And then my k value is my spring constant. And that's just going to be g times d wire to the fourth uh, divided by eight 
uh, times D, I need to put some parentheses here, eight times D uh, coil uh, to the third times the number of coils. Okay, so that, that defines my uh, spring constant, and that should be equal to point, uh, 7.5. Okay, now I'm going to keep going down the K wall. Okay, so I'm just going to define this as K wall. Uh, K, I'll do K kilowatts. Okay, kind of like kilowatt. Uh, four times the diameter of the coil minus the diameter of the wire um, divided by four times uh, diameter of coil minus diameter of wire. Okay, and then plus. If you want to do the um, continuation line in, in APM, just do the ampersand. It gets too long. 0 0.62 times diameter of wire um, divided by diameter of the coil. Okay, and then that should give you 1.145. Um, let me go ahead and define this intermediate value. Um, I used it in my other sheet, so I'm going to use it here as well. D, D coil divided by, now that, did I define pi up here? Okay, I defined pi. So let me go ahead and just use that. Um, divided by pi times d wire to the third. Okay, so if you didn't have constraints on d wire, one strategy is to move everything from the denominator um, into the numerator. And so one strategy would be to put this into the equation section and then just multiply pi times diameter of wire cubed onto the left-hand side, just posing it in open equation format. Okay, so we don't you don't necessarily need to do that in this case because we're constraining D wire to be greater than 0 0.01. So I, I think we should be okay. This, If it does go to 0 0.01, this could get very large because you're doing 0 0.01 to the cubed, and then that is in the denominator. So it can make this value very large. Um, so it's a, it's a very strong nonlinearity, and we'll just have to watch for that if we're having a hard time uh, converging to our solution. Okay, so we can either include these con these equations in the intermediate area. But these are kind of like temporary values that we're setting up, uh, not variables that we want to necessarily, um, you know, that we might use in our equations section, but they're explicitly defined up here. And you have to put them in sequential order. So if I'm going to use, for example, KW, I need to define KW before I use it in this next one. But in the equations section, uh, you can have them in any order and on the left or right hand side of the equation. So if I have these two, for example, in my equation section, um, I could then multiply this out um, over here, maybe make it a little bit easier for the solver to handle, and then I could also list KW uh, below that. Okay, so in any order in the equation section. Let me, let me go ahead and go back up to the intermediates. Um, section, and we'll just finish um, with these tau max equals 8. Now, Frank, I like your suggestion of just including the 8 in there, so I'm going I'm to go ahead and do that um, for these, and, and just don't forget to remind me to not to put the 8 into the other ones below, okay? So HF minus H0 uh, plus, uh, what, do, what do I define the... Uh, Delta naught, okay, delta naught, okay, and then that's going to be times K times M. Okay, so that's my tau max, and then my tau min is just going to be 8, I, I did the 8, uh, HF minus H naught um, times, times K uh, times M. Okay, so that's tau max and tau min that I've defined as, as intermediate values. Let me scroll down just a little bit here on the equations. Um, now I'm going to do my mean tau. Okay, and that's going to be tau max. Okay. Okay, let's see. HF. Okay, so good comment, Dustin. Thanks for saving me on that. Um, I have to put underscores there because I have those defined as underscores, you know, right here and then right here as well. Okay, so good catch on that one. Okay, so uh, tau max uh, plus 
Tao Min and uh, divided by um, divided by two. Okay, um, and then Tau. Uh, now, now the A is the uh, not the mean, but that is the um, you know the amplitude. The uh, what do they refer to that in the problem as? It's the alternating uh, stress. Okay, so that's going to be uh, this one right here, the alternating shear stress, and that's going to factor into one of the the constraints uh, below. So I'm going to do alternating uh, equals tau max minus tau min. Okay, and then do um, divided by two. Okay. Um, all right, so so let me do one other one. Um, I have a, uh, I think I might need a H. I'll just do H deflection. Um, it's going to be H naught minus delta uh, naught. Okay, so uh, let's see. Let me keep let me keep going then. Um, so now I have I have some constraints. I'm gonna, I'm just going to throw these into the equation section. Uh, I'm going to say that this one has got to be uh, greater than four. So d cool divided by d wire um, has got to be has got to be less or greater than four, less than sixteen. Okay. I'm also going to put in my um, my objective function, and this is I want to maximize. Actually, this is minimize. Let me maximize that. Maximize the pre uh, preload force uh, that I have for my spring. Okay, um, and I can put this either. You know, I can put this anywhere I want. Just for the sake, I always for the sake of uh, supposedly, I always like to put my objective function. At the top. Okay, so now I have my d coil plus d wire um, equals zero point five five. Uh, no, less, F defined? less than 0 0.75. What's that? Where is F defined? Um, F, that's a good question. F is not defined, is it? So uh, let's, let's define F. That's a great, uh, hold on, let me grab the door. Hey, come on in. You listen up on this problem? Yeah. Okay, we're still going through it right, right here, so. Uh, Sean just joined us here in the room. Um, good catch, Herman. So what is F going to be? Any thoughts on that? What's F? K times H0. So this is F right here. You see I have a, a no load, and then you put on a load, this is going to go to one inch. So it's so, K times HF minus H zero. Okay, great. Okay, so yeah, you just use this um, this equation down here, and delta X is going to be HF minus H zero times K, and K was your spring constant. Okay, that you define. That's a function of coil uh, coil diameter and also wire diameter as well. Okay, so that's your that's your spring constant. Delta X is HF minus H naught. Okay, so let's go back into the model and define that. Um, so HF, uh, let me put the underscore there. Dustin's going to get mad at me. Um, and H naught. Okay, so there is there is uh, my objective function that I define. I actually I want to define that um, down here because I defined it as a variable. If I took this one away, I could define it as an intermediate. You can either define it as a variable or an intermediate. In this case, I just want to define it as a variable so that I can see the solution like in my Python or MATLAB scripts. If I define it as an intermediate, none of these are accessible in the Python or MATLAB. They're just kind of like temporary variables, okay? So they're not reported. But this one I actually want to report. Um, and, and one comment, um, you know, from the class today as well as I noticed that um, what what APM does is it takes a maximize function and and converts it into a minimize function. It just takes the negative of any maximize statements that you have. 
And so sometimes the objective function is reported as a negative value in when when it's solving it. So just don't don't be confused by that if you do this. It you know maximize um, you know it'll, it'll just convert it automatically everything into a minimized problem. Just takes the negative value of that. Okay, but this is a way that I can just report the force directly. I don't have to worry about it putting a negative value on that in, in front of it for me. Okay, so um, let's let's keep going. Then we have um, let's see, we have a couple other constraints that we have to take care of. Any, any I don't want to spoil all of these. Okay, so so what is what is uh, this one? H deflection minus H S. Okay, why, why, does, why does that have to be less than 0 0.05? Actually, it's going to be greater than 0 0.05, isn't it? Because that's the clash. It's the clash that clash it then. Completely touching the wires touching the other. That's right. So we say that it has to be at least uh, 0 0.05 inches. Um, away from this this clashing, that's that's great, Sean and Mustafa. Uh, thanks for thanks for contributing that. Um, okay, so uh, that, there there was another constraint. Uh, any so what are the other constraints now? We have, do we have any others? So let's go back to let's go back to our problem statement and uh, and try to work through this. It, we had another constraint here. Um, we had some of these values. So how do we? So how do we put those in um, to the model? Well, one way is just directly into uh, tau alternating has to be less than S E uh, divided by S F. Okay, these these two are constant, so not a big problem with keeping it in you know the division here. Otherwise, you could um, you know, multiply through by S F there. Okay, so times S F, and then just um, just do that. Okay, but the S F is just equal to 1.5. That's the safety factor. Um, so I'm just going to keep it in the same way that we had it in the problem statement. Okay, so we have another one: tau alternating plus tau mean uh, less than uh, S Y divided by S F. Okay, so Let's look at take a look at S Y. Um, that's a function of the the wire diameter. Okay, S F again. That's a constant um, with the safety factor in there. Okay, so let's see. Mustafa alternate alternate stress should be less than or equal to S E over S F. Okay, um, S E over S F. Yeah, so I think that that one is is correct there. Um, thanks for the chat there, Mustafa. If there's something I didn't catch, um, make sure you. Um, uh, it should be less or uh, equal to S E over S F. Okay, you want to do that? Yeah. Okay, less than or equal to. Okay, so um, when, when we're doing, yeah, so these two are going to be. Near equivalent because um, in in optimization of continuous variables uh, we have some sort of convergence tolerance that we use anyway. So less than or equal to or or less than should be equivalent for this um, for this problem. If we had integer variables, then it would make a a difference. But let's go ahead and just put it in the less than or equal to there. Um, okay, great, good good catch on that, Mustafa. Okay, so any other uh, any other constraints? Or are we done? There's the struts of the solid height. Okay, good, Frank. You're never going to let us forget about this sentence, are you? Well, I was kind of irked that it was so early in the problem. <laughs> That's why okay. it's stuck in my mind. Okay, good. So, so we need to um, we we need to compute uh, a tau at the uh, you know, at the solid height, um, and that is going to be the. Uh, let's see that. That is going to be the H F uh, minus H not. Actually, we can just do H F 
minus HS, can't we? In this, in this case, HS, I didn't put an underscore there, um, but I could have. Um, so that's going to be that uh, times K times M. Okay, so that's my tau, my, my, uh, my stress at my solid height. Okay, and then uh, tau HS has got to be less than uh, SY. So, so one one thing that somebody asks is, you know, can, do we also need to put in the safety factor here? Um, let's go ahead and try it without without the safety factor, and then add it back in uh, later and, and just see um, how that affects the solution. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm just going to use the web interface for this. You know, this is maybe one of the easier ways to, to just replace the model here and then click optimize. And then it's going to quickly point out any syntax errors that I have in my model. In this case, I had H underbar S defined somewhere um, and it should have been uh, H S. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and just correct that in my text file. I'm going to go ahead and copy it back in. Um, you know, if this thing is too small, you just uh, click it and it'll expand to be the size of your model. Okay, so if you want to enter down, it will uh, expand as you need it. It won't contract, um, but it will expand. Okay, so let's go ahead and check this. Uh, Wow, look at that. So 96 iterations and it said optimal solution found. Okay, an objective is uh, 6.4. Okay, negative 6.4, but remember it, it converted it uh, from a maximum to a minimum. Um, and if we look at the diameter of the wire, uh, the diameter of the coil, the number of coils, um, the uh, free height is 1.4. Three six, okay, and the force is six point four five. Okay, so there's one solution. You know, I I don't know if that one is is going to be the optimal solution, but it definitely found a local uh, definitely found a local solution. Okay, so, so these are all um, you know all of the optimizers that are here in APM are local minima. So you, one of the one of the parts of this assignment is to start from different um, you know, different starting locations, and and uh, see if if uh, it gives you the same answer. Okay, so um, but here are you know the tau max, tau min, tau you know all of the uh, the intermediate variables that we had to find. Um, we have a couple slack variables that are at at constraints. Um, here we had, you know, so, so you can you can tell which ones these are by just counting. Uh, this is the the first, you know, the slack three, slack four. And so here's the first equation, the second equation, and then it's going to start with the third equation. This is really the fourth equation because you have a double inequality, and then fifth equation, sixth equation, seventh, eighth, ninth. Okay, so you have slacks three through nine. So slacks five and six were the ones that were active. So let's go down and find those. That's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, five and then six. So these two um, were the active constraints in this problem. So the rest of these were not active. So let, let's go ahead and try to add this safety factor in here and just see if that um, changes the solution or if we see that that slack variable is going to be active, um, you know, active at the solution. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and click optimize. Okay, this one found it a little bit faster, 44 iterations instead. Good for you. So in this case, it was active. Okay, so. So if you include the safety factor there on this last one, it's going to change your solution. Okay, it's going to change which ones are active. In this case, five and six still were active, but then also nine was active. 
and it, constraints always have the effect of lowering your objective function. Okay, so, or sorry, making your objective function worse. Okay, um, so let me go ahead and optimize this again. If I look down below, <clears throat> my optimal objective function was, you know, I'm trying to maximize my, my force. I got 6.45, but then when I added that safety factor in there, a more restrictive, uh, a more restrictive uh, constraint, then uh, in that case, my preload force <clears throat> was uh, 5.5.6 5 or 5.7. So um, you just keep that in mind when whenever you're doing optimization problems that um, if you include additional constraints, uh, it's always going to make your solution worse. Okay, especially if they're binding constraints. Um, it, it'll it'll lower your uh, you know it, the objective function won't be as good as it as it was previously. Okay, so that's that's one way to set it up. One one thing that we could try, you know, if we're having a hard time computing a solution, is we can try to move some of these variables back into the intermediate section. We could also try to move some of these variables from intermediates into the equation section. Okay, so I'm going to just move this these down here. Um, okay, and then what I need to do is, is go ahead and define these as variables as well. I'm just going to move um, these up into the variables declaration section. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and copy these and then just move these up into um, into variables, um, you know, I can give them initial values that are a function of, you know, the values that are above it. So it's okay to put this into your variable section. You know, that's the same equations if you want. If you want to redefine this as, let's say, I, I think SY should have an initial condition of, uh, you know, 1.4, you can do that as well. Or you can put in, um, you know, certain equations, let's say I want to initialize it with that. You know, it doesn't affect the, the final result, it just affects the initial values of where you start. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm just going to go ahead and plug this into uh, the, the model area and then try to optimize it again. Okay, so that was 100 iterations, it exceeded the maximum number of iteration, so it failed. Let me go ahead and try a different uh, solver as well. Try the, try the AP op solver, and we'll see if that is able to get a, a solution. Okay, so 14 uh, iterations. Um, so it would maybe did a little bit better than the IP op solver um, for this problem. Okay, so in that case, I had um, all of my variables and equations, you know. I had no intermediate values in that case. All I had were variables and equations, and you can put these in any order on the left or right-hand side of the equation. So, you know, for example, this might help you know, to avoid uh, some, you know, just uh, multiplying it over, avoiding the uh, you know divide by zero problems, um, and making it just a little bit easier for the solver to handle. Let's just go ahead and try that here. Okay, so I'm just going to save this and then plug it in here and then just try to re-optimize. Okay, so last time it was 14 iterations, this time 16 iterations, so it didn't do a lot. Um, solution time was still pretty low, 0 0.04 seconds, but it came up with the same uh, the same solution. Okay, any did I go any questions about this model or what we have set up? Sorry it wasn't more of a discussion today. I just wanted to kind of go through the model and and uh you know help with you know how to how to formulate this as a mathematical optimization problem. Um, one one of the things to to keep in mind is is on this problem um you know, the report is just a little bit different than the two-bar truss 
uh, problem. Jose, Jose's TA asked that we you know, put a summary table um, right at the beginning as well, just with your optimal uh, solution. Um, you know, but describe your model. Uh, tell you know, analysis variables, those are like your parameters of your model. Uh, design variables, those are the, the variables, you know, the decision uh, values. Analysis functions, you can think of those as like, um, you know, the intermediate section. And then design functions, those are like, um, you know, constraints like like these. Okay, so these these are analysis functions. You know, you're just computing, um, you know, things as a, a function of other variables or parameters. But uh, constraints that are binding uh, that influence your solution. These are these would be your uh, design functions. Okay, design functions. And then also your objective function. Those are design functions as well. Okay, um, let's see. So also describe your optimization problem. Um, you know, give various starting points. I'll, I'll just say that this may not be the, the global optimum, so you may want to start from different locations. Um, you know, start from different values. Uh, you know, plug those. You can either do that by plugging in different starting values here, um, and then, um, you know, see if you get a, a better objective function. Okay, so you can also see that from your contour plot. You know, if you generate a contour plot, um, you can see if you have local uh, minima, and, and you'll be able to see that when you when you plot your values here. Now you'll have to um, do this for coil diameter versus wire diameter. The other two, um, you know, the other two that you have there, like the number of coils or the free height, you'll have to fix those at certain values. Um, and then generate these these contour plots. Okay, so um, you'll have to just you know you could you could just, I, I'd recommend finding your optimal solution first, plugging in your optimal values of n coils and HF, and then generate your contour plot as a function of wire and coil diameter. Okay, and then zoom in, you know, mark the feasible space, and then. Um, you know, also just include a copy of your model or other things that might be useful, just as a as an appendix, um, you know, appendix to your report as well. Okay, any other questions, guys? Uh, good. I, thanks for catching some of those errors as I went through it. You know, it's easy to make, um, you know, easy to make some mistakes. So thanks for catching those. Um, anyway. Um, Okay, so Dustin had a question. You know, what's the best way to to troubleshoot? Um, so if you are having, uh, you know, problems. So he, I'm getting. So Dustin, Dustin said he's getting 396 for the solutions. Okay, so I'd say that maybe the best way to troubleshoot is to first of all just make sure your model is right. So go ahead and move those from the variable section up to the parameter section. Um, plug in the nominal conditions. Uh, I gave you a sample design, so plug in these four, and then make sure you're getting these values. Uh, that, that's where I would start. If you're if you're having a hard time getting a different solution, um, you know, uh, you know, maybe that you don't have a, a constraint in here. Um, you know, you're missing one of the constraints. Uh, these were two that were active, I think uh, you saw that these two, um, you know, were active constraints. Um, so, yeah, so, so yeah, just go ahead and do it with zero degrees of freedom first, um, just to make sure you have the right values, um, and then you can go back later and then make, uh, you know, make these optimization design variables later. Okay. All right. Any other questions, guys? Any other comments? Um, okay, I think we're good. Um, I think that's gonna we're about out of time now. Let me just talk about what we'll um, what we'll talk about next time. These these help sessions I've tried to set them up so that you know we kind of have it's very hands on um, you know sessions that you know we kind of work through some examples. Um, in this case, you know just working through the the homework problems a little bit of help on that. Um, next time, what we'll do is is uh, we'll focus. We'll start in on 
the heat integration uh, problem uh, for Friday session or the slurry pipeline. If you if you look at the schedule, the schedule says that the next homework problem is either the heat integration or the slurry pipeline. And, and these can be done in groups as well, groups of two. Okay. Um, but we'll we'll, uh, we'll try to attack um, just for next time. We'll go over the heat integration problem, uh, slurry pipeline. We'll, we can save that for another time. But but go ahead and try to work through um, heat integration problem for next time. We'll just we'll just start um, start on that one. Okay. So pasteurization of milk and heat integration. Okay. So it, uh, some of the chemical engineers and the or mechanical engineers might have a little bit easier time with this one. Um, you know, slurry pipeline. This is also a, a very good one. This is you know, if you don't have uh, as much experience in in uh, you know refrigeration cycles or uh, heat pump, uh, you know this one might be a better better application. <laughs> 